today's subject is spiritual adventure. <clears throat> now sometimes it may not strike us very clearly the connection between a spirit of adventure and spiritual life. Because most people turn to spiritual life as a solution to the problems in this world. There are different ways of turning to spirituality. By choice, by deliberate thinking, discrimination, and also by compulsions. These are some of the uh, situations which, which force us to turn to spiritual life. Choice. To make a choice, we need certain compelling situations. So that also is a kind of compulsion. But there is a difference Sometimes spirituality becomes a flight from the realities and problems of life in this world. It has happened to many. And very often, such spiritual seekers do not always succeed. I can give examples. See. Suppose a compelling, unpleasant situation, either social or domestic or family situation, takes us to intense spiritual life. And we take to spiritual life as a solution to some of these problems. Now what happens is when such spiritual seekers start facing problems in spiritual life, then they return, they go back to their previous life. This is one serious problem. That's why it is very important to understand that spiritual life is also kind of an adventure. If you read the life of any great spiritual person, any of the great saints belonging to any religious or spiritual tradition, you always find at the beginning there is kind of a flight a movement towards higher spiritual pursuit. And then there is an attempt to get settled in that spiritual pursuit. And then a set of problems, conflicts and challenges, external and internal. In the case of great spiritual teachers like Buddha, they had to face mostly internal problems. That's why we read in the life of Buddha uh, a demon, an evil uh, personality, Mara, coming and tempting him. Sometimes the experiences of previous life come to the surface. So you find you, you, in, in Buddha's tradition, traditional Buddhist tradition, Buddhist uh, biography, they say Buddha was the fulfillment, the culmination of a series of spiritual evolution. He had lived in many places as kings, as princes, as mendicants, belonging to all walks of life, doing all kinds of work. And finally, Buddha, Buddhahood was reached in his last birth when he was born as a prince, the son of a king uh, in a small kingdom in today's Nepal, which was at that time part of India. Now, here you find a gradual evolution, but in the life of Buddha, written by Ashoghosha, around 7th century AD, you find his problems were mostly internal, except a competition or a challenge, a rivalry from his uh, cousin brother during his early days. But then if you read the lives of the great Christian saints of medieval times, 
you find they had to face problems both at the internal and also external level. You find them praying, meditating, and also sometimes being uh, persecuted uh, by the inquisitors. Sometimes many of them were burnt at stake. Most of them got only a post-mortem recognition. They were declared as saints, proclaimed as saints. They were given, they were canonized after their passing away. So in their cases, they had to face both internal and also external problems. So, but in the life of common spiritual seekers, you find mostly they had to face internal problems. It is left us to make a choice whether to come to Vedanta Society on Sunday morning or go elsewhere. There are so many places where people could spend their time. So, in modern times, in the lives of ordinary spiritual seekers, most of the problems and challenges that they have to encounter are at the internal level, at the mental level. <clears throat> so that clears the common misunderstanding that spiritual life is a bed of roses. It can never be. In fact, one of the first uh, important conditions and qualifications of an ideal devotee of God, according to Bhagavad Gita, is a strong mind, an iron will, an iron determination. So, if you are interested, if you take the twelfth chapter of the Gita, you find, most probably, in the, from the thirteenth verse onwards, Lord Krishna gives a list of important characteristics uh, of an ideal devotee. Santushta satatam yoki yatatma dhridhanishcheha mayar pida manobuddhi yoman bhakta same prayer. This is the verse, the translation is, he is my ideal devotee. Who? Who is contented? If a turning to the path of God should make us contented, should not make us miserable, so there could be external and internal challenges, but we must be able to face all this with a contented mind. It's sometimes a paradox. How can we be contented within and face difficulties? Well, when we face problems and challenges in material life, we cannot be contented within. We'll be discontented. We'll be dissatisfied. We'll be depressed. If money is lost, it's a challenge. You won't be contented. If you, if you lose your job, it's a challenge. We can't face that problem, that challenge with contentment within. But when one makes a choice, and a very important choice in his or her life, to turn to the path of God, that very, I, that very experience of choosing a higher goal in spiritual life should give us an air of contentment. It is not satisfaction in his worldly sense, but an inner contentment. Well, I have chosen a path which is the best, which may be full of thorns, problems and difficulties. Still, this is the path which I have chosen. The very idea of choosing the path gives us an inner satisfaction. That is the inner contentment that is meant. So Lord Krishna says, if a spiritual seeker is found to be miserable, unhappy, really unhappy, he is not a genuine spiritual seeker. You should not misunderstand. It doesn't mean that every spiritual seeker gets all his dreams and expectations fulfilled. No, not at all. Far from it. The point is, in spite of problems and challenges facing in spiritual life, there is always an inner element of blissfulness, contentment within. And that contentment doesn't come out of achieving anything, but out of the feeling, well, I have made a noble choice. I have taken a decision to evolve to a higher level of spiritual life. 
that gives us a tremendous feeling of inner contentment and lord krishna says this is the first hallmark the first characteristic of an ideal devotee of god and then and the, the most important characteristic is the dhrdhanishcha means a man of or a woman of strong will strong decision and iron will you find all these great spiritual seekers what all they had to face but they will they never retrace their steps you know sometimes back i refer to the grand inquisitor in fact the cardinal who was the inquisitor he was making a point of course he said well we made a pact with the satan and satan gave you three choices trying to tempt the jesus i'm referring to the grand inquisitor which i already referred to once in the brothers karamazov of fyodor dostoevsky but jesus didn't accept any of those challenges not out of cowardice because jesus wanted humanity to make their own choice to take the path to god then only we will spiritually evolve so maybe the satan promised to make him the emperor the ruler of the world so that every human being in this world could be forced you should start meditating every day go to church every day that way nobody is going to get liberation if you if a government passes a law which makes it mandatory for everyone to take the spiritual life there will be no spiritual progress for anybody so all these choices and decisions should be made at the voluntary level that's a point which is made which is uh, which is um, uh, emphasized by the author of the fantasy poem in grand inquisitor in the fifth book of fifth section of the brothers of karamazo the ivan fyodorovich karamazo the middle brother I mean the intellectual anarchist i'm not going to those details we already referred to that in a previous session so the common misunderstanding a spiritual life solves all material problems and if you turn away from material life and turn to spiritual life then we are entering a bed of roses where there will be no challenge no problem at all it is a very very serious misunderstanding it is like trying to swim against the current swimming against the current doesn't guarantee that we will make steady progress throughout but it guarantees one thing we will not be swept off the off our feet in the opposite direction see think of a river that is flowing in one direction and if you enter the river and stand steady doing nothing then the current will take us in the opposite direction in the direction of worldliness worldly misery but on the other hand if you make an attempt make an effort to swim the current may not be able to take us drag us in the opposite direction we may not be able to progress very fast but we could we would always be able to move make some progress some movement forward fighting against the current spiritual life is like that there is always a current in the opposite direction swami vivekananda referring to this idea makes a very passing remark in one context he says it is struggle that makes human life worthwhile struggle in fact that this struggle this struggle in spiritual life is what actually distinguishes human beings from the members of the animal kingdom the animals never make any struggle they may struggle for food and shelter they may drive they may run away when it starts raining they may they may struggle to get food but they do not make a struggle at the psychological mental or at least for never at the spiritual level so every spiritual effort is an attempt to move against the current even if the struggle doesn't guarantee ultimate fulfillment still it guarantees one thing we won't be dragged in the opposite direction that is the most important aspect of spiritual life so in this sense it is an adventure it needs a lot of courage a lot of determination and iron will 
to face problems at the mental level. When we start medit to meditate, when we pray, all the accumulated tendencies and impressions going back to several lives in the past may suddenly emerge in the mind. And may perhaps so, let's, in one way it would say, let we can start an intense spiritual practice for tomorrow onwards. So this procrastination continues with Patanjali considers to be a very serious drawback, obstacle in spiritual life, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. But maybe the earliest book, classic on spiritual psychology. He says, procrastination, laziness, cowardice, unwillingness to take risk and face problems is one of the most serious impediments, obstacles in spiritual life. So, to face all these problems, one needs courage, a strong iron will. Well, and remember, all that appears may not be helpful to us. I can drive home this idea in the light of an interesting story, because that um, will make explicit many of these ideas which may appear to be a bit academic and abstract. There's a story of a small boy in one of the spiritual classics. For those of you who are interested, you can remember the Srimad Bhagavata Purana in the fourth chapter, fourth book rather, fourth book from eight to twelve chapters there is an interesting episode described which uh, drive home the idea of the importance of manliness and iron will and strength and inner courage to face challenges in spiritual life. The story begins like this. In ancient times, there was a king the king had two wives in those days. Bigami was common. Dhruva was a small boy. He was the son of the elder queen. And the king had a son born to the younger queen also. The king's name was Uttanapada. The prince, the small boy whom we are Referring to his, his name is Dhruva. Interestingly, Sister Nivedida has drawn a pen picture of this episode in one of her books. You can get that book perhaps in, the, in our bookstore. It, 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 uh, it comes in one of Sister Nivedida's well-known works. <clears throat> she was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, who was born as Margaret Noble in Ireland, who later became a disciple of Swami Vivekananda. So this boy one day wanted to come close to his father. Maybe a five-year-old boy wanted to be fondled with affection by his father. The stepmother was standing nearby. She didn't like it. Maybe she made some very unpleasant remarks and the king perhaps could not react properly raise himself up to the situation, so to speak. And it drew out, got terribly hurt. He went back. He went away. Went to his mother. Mother's name is Suniti. Names are not so important. But the story and his inner message is very important. So this boy went to his mother and complained, my father didn't allow me to come to him and stepmother scolded ill-treated, maybe. Now, the mother said, look here, uh, uh, you don't worry. She didn't, quarrel, she didn't go and quarrel with the stepmother. She didn't go and pick up a quarrel with the row with, with the husband either. What she did, all this happened because of your previous karmas. These things we had to face in life, remember, and mother is telling a five-year-old boy, but the story is very important for the inner story behind. So, she said, she concluded her uh, 
instructions you turn to god god is the one solution devotion or turning to god is the one solution to all the problems in life so you go to forests and pray to god in this context god is mahavishnu in the story and uh, if i give i give you my blessings you can you, if god f- fulfills your wants all the problems will be solved Dhruva took it very seriously and went to the forest. Now, on, now uh, the important part of the episode opens. Dhruva was slowly walking in the forest. A great sage, Narada, was also wandering in the same forest. He was perhaps, he was meditating in the forest. Sometimes he will take a walk. Now, Narada is a well-known figure in these mythological books. His one main job was to seek out and find spiritual seekers who are in need of some help and go to them and help them and give them a helping hand, a direction, in the right direction, some instruction. That was his main job. That was Narada's main. He was a great sage of ancient times. So, Narada found a small boy of five years walking alone in the forest weeping and crying and also cr- taking the name of god loudly loudly uttering the name of god so dhruva narada was both surprised and amused so narada came to this small boy he said look here what's the matter you are a small boy do you want me to take you back to your home i can help you Dhruva said, Dhruva, Dhruva narrated the whole incident, the whole episode, what happened in the palace. How he was almost insulted in the presence of his father by his stepmother. So then Narada also tried to test this boy. Is he really fit? Is he ready, ready for this spiritual adventure? So Narada tried to test this boy. He, you are a small boy. I can take you to your home, to your palace. See, he's a prince after all. And I can talk to your father, your stepmother and others. They will not trouble you anymore. And remember, these problems are natural. Sometimes we, are, we, we know, sometimes this could happen. A well-meaning friend could tell us, well, why should you go to meditate? These things are not necessary. If you tell them, well, I am facing a lot of internal conflicts, anxieties. So I want to read this holy book, maybe Bible, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Bhagavad Gita, any book. That's, so I want to go and listen to some of the lectures on the spiritual topics that gives me a lot of peace of mind. So that's why I'm going to be under society or any such spiritual place. Some friends may tell us, well, these problems are natural. Let us go to some other place. There are better places where you don't have to meditate and forget all this. There are many things that could you that make you forget all problems. But then, when the intoxicating effect is gone, all these problems will reemerge with greater intensity, with more with terrifying force. These these things will not make us. Um, solve the problems, will not enable us to solve the problems, but may make us forget these problems, may benumb our senses and mind, may reduce, may decrease the sensitivity of the mind to these problems, but once the effect is gone, these problems come back with terrifying force, and we become addicted to these things. This is a problem. Now here, Narada's intention was not that. Narada's intention was twofold. One, he wanted to see if this boy is really serious. If he's just crying about in the for- walking in the forest, I should take him back to his home. But if he's really a spiritual seeker, then I should help him. That was his intention. So Narada came and looked here, you don't worry, I will help you go back to your palace. Don't bother. Narada, then in reply to this, Dhruva said, Well, my mind is hurt. 
I have taken a decision. My mother told me that I should meditate upon God. God will solve all the problems. So, I, have, I won't turn back. I won't go back to my palace, to my home, without, before, realizing the goal for which I have set out this journey. Narada was immensely happy. And there is an exclamation in Sanskrit, Aho teja kshatriyana means, Oh, the determination, the strong will of this young boy who has started on this spiritual adventure. Narada came to him, instructed him, taught him some mantras, taught him how to meditate, how to chant the name of God, and how to practice contemplation. And Dhruva did that. Dhruva followed the instructions of the sage. And in six months, he had a vision of God. That's how the story goes. And after six months of spiritual penance, he returned to his palace. By the time, by God's grace, the king, the queen, and all others have undergone a complete mental transformation. They welcomed Dhruva and uh, accepted him. And when the king passed away, he became the next king. That's how the story goes. And the idea is, this, this, this episode drives home one point. Narada, the sage, was trying to test the boy. The boy did not listen to him and say, oh, you are right, Let, I'm ready to go home. No. He had taken a decision to take on this spiritual adventure. And he was, he, had, he, was a man, he was a boy of strong iron will. So this iron determination, strong determination, is the first important qualification necessary for anybody who takes to spiritual life. As I said earlier, there are problems at the internal level. All, I, all the accumulated tendencies and impressions will come back to the, will emerge and appear on the surface of the mind. And these tendencies may not always be conducive to spiritual life. Because our character is, not, is a, like a bag or like a lake, call it anything you like. A bag full of tendencies and impressions that we have accumulated in previous life and also in this life. Whatever we do consciously, whatever thought we think, whatever actions we do, all these will leave a residual impact on the mind. And this remains stored up in this mental storehouse. Some of them may be very good. That's why if, the, if there is a surplus of positive tendencies and impressions created by good actions and good thoughts and good life in the past, that will help us propel us to move forward in spiritual life. That's why sometimes there are many spiritual seekers who can't but meditate. They, if, you, if anybody tries to uh, dissuade them, to move them away from that spiritual path, they won't listen. They won't quarrel, but then they would ignore it. That's why in spiritual life, there is a great instruction in the same classic. How we must interact with, with our fellow human beings with the external world, while facing problems, while undertaking the spiritual adventure. First, we must give up all negative thought currents and develop a positive thought current, a positive focus. If we can focus our energies and mind in one direction, the mind itself becomes a strong, mighty weapon that could be used for creative purposes, uh, like a knife in the hands of a surgeon. So, if we can develop 
evolve in inner focus towards which we can direct our time and energy all our activities that's one way to develop a spiritual personality that help us to take up the spiritual adventure with comparative ease but then if we do not make an effort to develop an inner focus our energies may get scattered in fact that's the main reason for confusion and perplexities what is confusion confusion is nothing but scattered energy resources when the inner energy system gets scattered mind also becomes highly uh, disintegrated it not only uh, destroys the concentration and focus but also it creates lot of confusion and perplexities within and that 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 makes the mind blunt incapable of going deeper into anything and also uh, turns it into our enemy a confused mind is a great enemy in the in in the gita there is a statement uddhare atmanatmanam na atmanam avasya avasadi atmaiva khyatmanu bindhu atmaiva riburatmanaha the meaning is this mind is our best friend if we can develop this inner focus mind is a worst enemy if we do not make an effort to develop this inner focus how do we do this whatever we do whatever we think give it a spiritual orientation we may be interested in reading books there are people who are bookworms there are people who are computer worms if that term is acceptable well the internet provides a lot of information on spiritual life so make use of that skill and give it a spiritual orientation god word orientation that way all the activities all the so called distractions become slowly focused so distractions vanish mind gets an inner focus and if we want mental peace the first requirement is to develop this inner focus all the senses of perception and mind should be given a good word orientation seeing try to see good things visual objects hear hear good things sometimes one on one or two occasions i had an opportunity to visit some of the old care homes you know so sometimes you find old people who should be thinking of higher spiritual things trans empirical values spending hours watching terminator 1 2 3 4 mind you and maybe within within weeks within months they may leave this world behind so mind gets attuned to these things so that's why our scriptures make a great declaration that all our activities our interactions with the external world should be given a god word orientation there is a famous verse in this classical work i should quote this and then get explained ishare tad adhineshu balisheshu dithutsu cha prema maitri krupa upeksha yak karodi samadhyamah the description of three types of devotees the highest and the lowest who are the middle ones those devotees like ordinary common spiritual seekers who constitute the majority of spiritual aspirants what should be our approach we should have devotion to us god by developing this inner spiritual focus by giving a god word spiritual orientation to the mind and also the five senses of perception and five senses of action see try to see things which are helpful in spiritual life we, we there is no way to hear may we, we may not have enough time so try to hear uh, at least once a while i did i mean listen to ideas 
which are helpful in spiritual life. And then, so devotion to God. And then, a, if, a, a relationship based on equality and friendliness towards fellow spiritual seekers. The spiritual seekers, devotees of God, can, can come together and discuss ideas and topics and subjects related to the spiritual life that reinforce our spiritual thirst, spiritual hunger. And it also helps us to give a spiritual orientation to a total personality. And then we should have compassion towards those who are interested in spiritual life but who would like to know more about it. We should discuss with them. But then what about the challenges? There are people whose very presence will make us forget spiritual ideas. If you talk to them, if you interact with them, at that very moment, everything other than spiritual ideas emerges in the mind. In fact, negative personalities are very powerful. Look at the mighty Look at a man like Hitler. What a man of strong determination he had. Much stronger than he drew us determination. So Hitler had a much stronger personality than many spiritual seekers. But, and they were very, they had tremendous persuasive power. So sometimes people with negative ideas, with evil ideas, with totally unspiritual ideas, have tremendous power to pursue it, to influence our mind. At that time, we have to evolve an inner spiritual mechanism, a kind of spiritual filtering, filtering mechanism, a kind of inner reflex action, an ability to move away, to turn away from people who talk about negative ideas, who are full of negative, negative frequencies, negative temperaments, from whom we can only expect negative or harmful, spiritually harmful ideas. We must develop an inner mechanism which enable us, which would enable us to move automatically away from those people and those ideas. This is very important. So, that's why Upeksha, the verse says, Upeksha means total indifference, complete indifference. You should not fight with them because that also creates problems. If you fight with an evil person, unnecessarily, if it is thrust upon you, you have to do it. But you should not seek out a fight with an evil person because that also creates an inner entanglement, inner attachment. So complete indifference, that's the only approach towards spiritual, spiritually harmful persons and ideas. So, and all these ideas are important because spirituality is not a conviction or a concept or an idea. It is more related to culture than convictions. See, convictions and intellectual ideas go skin deep. We understand this only when a real problem arises. I can give an example. Suppose we read spiritual classics, fill our intellect with spiritual ideas. And we look upon ourselves as a spiritual seeker just because we are reading spiritual books. We are spiritual seekers, no doubt. But intellectual acquaintance alone cannot uh, take us to the spiritual path. At least it cannot help us to advance uh, a long distance. If intellectual ideas go deeper, they become part of our inner culture. As is, culture goes much deeper than convictions. Many people are not able to continue in spiritual path. Sometimes they feel boredom. Sometimes they feel, well, there is nothing coming in. There is nothing visible. Nothing obviously beneficial. 
So better stop here. That that this idea is very misleading because this idea is rooted in the in the in in an, in, in another idea. That is that spirituality is nothing but acquaintance with spiritual ideas. Acquaintance with spiritual ideas certainly is important. It is paramount, but it is only stepping stone in spiritual life. From convictions and concepts, this idea should come down to the level of emotions and feeling. Then convictions become culture. Culture is related to mind. Convictions are related to intellect. And intellectual convictions are wavering. They are based upon logical prepositions, logical thinking process. If you are convinced of certain things, then if you are sincerely convinced, then that conviction goes beyond logical uh, feasibility. It becomes an emotional content. It becomes emotional feeling. That's why Swami Vivekananda makes a interesting remark, a very astounding remark. It, it, this kind of interpretation is necessary to fully understand the implication. One is good because he, he can't help being good. One is bad because he can't help being bad. Now what do you make out of it? There are people who cannot do anything evil deliberately. Not, because, not just because they are convinced of the evil of doing evil things, but because the practice of never doing anything evil has become part of inner culture. So it has come down to the mental level, which is far beyond the intellectual level. And then the same is true in the other direction also. So what is needed is, to bring the spiritual ideas from the level of convictions and concepts to the level of inner feeling and emotions, then we understand spirituality is not a matter of intellectual conviction or philosophization. It is a matter of inner experience. And once we could develop a spiritual culture within us, a spiritual character within us, a spiritual emotional nature, if a feelings get a spiritual orientation, then we are on the, on the right track to a spiritual experience. It is experience that makes a spiritual. It is not religious convictions. That's why it's often emphasized that spirituality goes beyond religions. Religion is a matter of dogmas and doctrines and belief systems and rituals which may not go very deep which are certainly good, which are helpful, at least in the long run, we will get the benefit. But that is only a stepping stone. Spirituality is a matter of inner experience. Uh, here, at least, I mean, these ideas are interpreted from different angles. In devotional philosophy, there is a gradual evolution from self-reliance to self-surrender. As I said, a strong will, an iron determination are necessary for a spiritual seeker, which is related to the idea of self-reliance. We must have strong faith, what we call manliness or womanliness in our modern times. We have to use it that. So we have a strong confidence self-reliance, to start this spiritual journey, self-reliance. So at the end of self-reliance, we culminate with self-surrender. And when we reach the level of self-surrender, we, we understand that the manliness or the courage and determination that that helped us in our spiritual journey were also a part of God's grace, which is ultimately what self-surrender is all about. So that's why Shankaracharya wrote in a famous book 
the name of the book is Vishnu Shatpadi. It's a famous uh, devotional hymn by Shankaracharya. It's a very interesting. Satyabhi bheta bhagame nath tavaham na mamaki inastum samudropi tarangha na kojana samudra tarangha. The meaning is this. See. We belong to the, uh, the, the we belong to God. God doesn't belong to us. The waves and firms and the water pebbles in an ocean belong to the ocean. But the ocean doesn't belong to the waves and the firms. That's the idea behind. So the, at the end of this devotional fulfillment, we realize that we belong to God. God doesn't belong to us. But this is the penultimate state of the highest devotee. When the devotee goes still beyond that, he realizes that God is within him and he is within God. The two, uh, two levels of supreme achievement, both are higher levels of spiritual evolution. One is, we feel that we belong to God. That, but God doesn't belong to us in the sense that God is not exhausted by individual beings. At the higher level, we feel that we live in God and God lives within us. Those who are interested may turn to the 8th verse of 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. 8th verse, 12th chapter. There is a famous Mayeva mana athatsua mai buddhim nivesya nivasi shesi mayeva adaudham nasamsya. I shall explain this. At the highest level, a spiritual seeker experiences that he is the residence of God, the permanent residence of God. And God is his own permanent residence. His address is God, and God's address is his. That's the idea behind it. So he lives in God, and God lives in him. This is the devotional, this is the peak of devotional evolution of a spiritual seeker. At the non-dualistic, advaitic level, we realize that the one reality, the supreme reality, which is all-pervading, is residing within us. And the same reality, which is residing within all of us, is also the all-pervading supreme reality. From the standpoint of the path of knowledge, from the path of devotion, we experience, remember this is not a conviction, not a conviction, but an experience that God lives within us. We live in God. Often, the great problem with traditional organized religions was these ideas were taken up, but they were interpreted only as concepts and doctrines and dogmas. Now, there are two ways of looking at these spiritual ideas that is very important for anybody who takes the spiritual journey to understand. If you look upon these ideas or convictions and dogmas and doctrines, on the one hand, we feel, well, I am God's devotee. That makes us proud, haughty, and we look upon all others as alien to God. If, you, if this is understood as a doctrine or dogma. Secret dogmatism, fundamentalism. On the other hand, if we get a little, a flash of the inner experience of the same idea, it makes us more humane, more compassionate, and more broad-minded, more accommodative towards others. That is the problem of religion and spirituality. All the great teachers of the world taught spirituality but they were reduced to the level of religions, and when they become religions, they become, I mean, they become uh, dogmas, they are interpreted as doctrines and dogmas, which draw boundary lines between followers of different religious traditions. The same ideas, for example, the ideas that you find in the Sermon on the Mount, if you look, if you interpret them as ideas and concepts, well, you can draw lines of demarcation between geographical, 
കൾച്ചറൽ ബൗണ്ടറീസ് ഇഫ് യു ഇന്റർപ്രിറ്റ് ദ സ്പിരിച്വൽ ഐഡിയാസ് ദ ആർ യൂണിവേഴ്സൽ സ്പിരിച്വൽ ട്രൂസ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് ദി ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് പോയിന്റ് ടു അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡ് ഇൻ സ്പിരിച്വൽ അഡ്വെഞ്ചർ സ്വാമി വിവേകാനന്ദ he can made an interesting statement in the inspired talks which he gave in the in thousand island park this he says if somebody tells you that he is inspired and talks nonsense reject him that's the meaning now suppose somebody tells well i am highly inspired i have seen god so i hate all others except my own people then you 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 don't want him or his god that's why swami ji says so true inspiration makes us more humane it brings out the inner humanness in fact gives a spiritual dimension to humanness we think that's what it means so uh, spirit true spiritual adventure is a journey to this inner experience leaving behind the realms of convictions and ideas and philosophies to us experience om shanti 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 hari om dakshin shanti shanti